So welcome uh, everybody uh, and welcome to, to this uh, next session of a seminar. And today we have a pleasure to, to hear Eric Permutter who will talk about his work on harnessing S-duality in N equal four super young males and gravity. How about now? I just turned it on. I think that just probably helped. Sorry. Yeah. I can keep going? Okay, good. Yes. Sorry about that. So, so this work is based on a paper um, with Scott Collier, who's a postdoc at Princeton from last, um, this past January. And the, this being a math phys seminar, um, I'm going to spend a bit of time explaining some of the mathematical foundations, which were important for the physics that came out and a bit less time talking about some of the holographic implications. Um, there's a lot that could be said, but I'll, I'll definitely not get to it today. Feel free to ask about it either today or some other time. So in broad strokes, this talk is about S-duality and N equals four super Yang mills and holography and their entwinement. So to basically quote from the very beginning of our paper, we had two goals. The first was to understand how to extract the full implications and really, I mean the physical implications of S-duality for observables in superconformal field theories, focusing mostly on N equals four super Yang mills in this project. And secondly, to put this in the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence, where N equals four is on one side of the most heralded example of the correspondence, but we'll actually have something new to say about this uh, with these techniques. So first, let me just introduce the theory. So what will we need? Luckily, not too much. We'll be studying the four-dimensional N equals four theory. This is the maximally supersymmetric conformal gauge theory in four dimensions. And the theory contains a complexified gauge coupling tau, which is written in terms of the topological theta angle and G ang mills, which I'm just calling G in this way. And tau is an exactly marginal coupling, so it parameterizes a conformal manifold. In this case, the conformal manifold that preserves the full N equals four superconformal symmetry is just parameterized by tau. Uh, and so there's a one complex dimensional conformal manifold M, which I've drawn in this teardrop shape uh, with that point at the top to represent the cusp where the free theory lives and the coupling G goes off to infinity, to zero rather. Uh, so there's a map between the uh, upper half plane uh, in tau and the conformal manifold that these observables which depend on tau implement. <coughs> uh, please. Uh, uh, yes, yes, but in, an, er, uh, in a, an internal sense where this is parameterizing a coupling, but indeed, uh, to, to, to transition to the next point, the theory enjoys uh, what's known as S-duality, which for a simply laced gauge group is a self-duality under SL2Z transformations of tau. There are some global issues in making that statement, but they won't be relevant for what I say today. And it's a strong weak duality, so the Large G and small G regions, roughly speaking, are mapped to each other under this duality. And the duality in the theory is, I would say, beyond a reasonable doubt. There's been a lot of work on this uh, going back pretty much 40 plus years uh, on the field theory side and then starting 25 years ago in the context of holography. And all computations, whether they're related to instantons or the coupling constant dependence of terms in the one of N expansion of things like correlation functions, all confirm the existence of this, this invariance of the theory. You might be familiar with the statement, if you're a string theorist, that 10D strings in flat space admit an SL2Z symmetry of their own, uh, which acts on the complexified string coupling, also usually called tau. Uh, and the ADS5 times SI compactification, which is dual to the N equals four theory, preserves this symmetry. So those SL2Zs uh, are, are mapped to each other under the correspondence. So given this symmetry, we can restrict observables to, to depend on tau in the fundamental domain only. And so we'll be concerned with non-perturbative observables, which I'll call O, uh, which obey an SL2Z invariance equation. So not every observable in the theory obeys this, but wide classes, essentially local all local observables obey this equation. Non-local things involving extended objects may obey 
a different equation involving congruent subgroups of SL2Z, but I won't talk about that today. So things like correlators, uh, OPE coefficients, formal weights, properly understood, should be thought of as being SL2Z invariant. And so the question we want to understand is what is the explicit modular structure of these observables? And it's a hard problem because, as I mentioned before, this is a strong weak duality, so you need control uh, over tau it, for arbitrary values of the coupling. So for example, for Jiang mills of order one, and that's therefore inherently non-perturbative. And in the Tuff limit where integrability rules, S-duality is obscured because it is a double scaling limit where G is taken to zero. So it's there, but it's hard to see. So to summarize, in regimes where we can actually do computations, you can't actually see the symmetry operating. Now you might say the conformal bootstrap can do non-perturbative things, can this not help? Uh, and of course it can, but if you're trying to understand the explicit functional dependence on tau of something, if you have a numerical plot, you can extract that in any simple way. Um, and so that's the gap that we're trying to close. So to summarize, uh, sorry, I don't know what happened here, n equals four super Yang Mills has a symmetry that we've not fully used. And so the point of view of the talk is to try to use it, and by that I mean to incorporate it from the outset of calculations by finding a kind of basis for observables which is automatically invariant under the symmetry, which reduces them to their essential dynamical content. <clears throat> and the idea is to apply the spectral theory of SL2Z to this problem, uh, which is equivalent to saying that we're going to use harmonic analysis on the modular surface, F. This is a robust tool. It applies to any SL2Z invariant observable, uh, at finite n or at large n. And one of the main points of the talk is that it gives a very different presentation of a very well-studied theory that I hope has more to say in the future. Uh, and we'll get a lot from a little. So once the framework's in place, we do relatively elementary calculations and we find interesting things. So I'm hopeful that there's more stuff to, to say. And so let that be the one message you take from this talk, if nothing else. Yes? What is the n you have at finite n? Ah, good, sorry. Um, thanks. So, so n is the rank of the gauge group. You can think of that as the parameterizing the number of degrees of freedom of the theory. So um, we don't need to be in a limit where you have lots of degrees of freedom. It applies for any, any such theory um, for any, any parameters. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, and please feel free to interrupt with questions uh, anytime. OK. Uh, so to make a statement about the supergravity limit, and then we'll, we'll transition to the bulk of the talk, and the, the main introduction will be over. In the expansion around strong TUF coupling, which again I will, I will define more precisely later. The n equals four theory is famously dual to type 2b supergravity with a prescribed set of stringy corrections. And the spectral decomposition approach reveals that there's an emergent ensemble average in the context of this duality. And that can be stated as follows. The large n limit of the ensemble average theory is the strong coupling planar uh, theory, that is to say the supergravity limit. And I'll define what it means to take an ensemble average shortly, uh, and we'll, especially toward the latter half of the talk, substantiate this, this equivalence um, and explain how to think about this picture, which on the right is supposed to be an average over the conformal manifold, and on the left is supposed to be the strongly coupled point. Um, but this is just a, a hint of what's to come um, in, in a short snippet. Okay. So here's the outline for the rest of the talk. Like I said, I mostly won't talk about supergravity and the, the fun issues that arise there. Uh, and most of the paper is spent at finite end because these techniques um, are on very firm footing and you don't need to take asymptotic limits to see, to see what's, uh, what's interesting about them. So I'll start by introducing the spectral decomposition that we'll use. I'll explain why it applies to n equals four. Uh, we'll say some interesting things about the structure of observables and instantons in this theory. And one benchmark for everything we say that will be really useful is a certain uh, four-point function integrated over space-time that was studied recently by Doragoni, Green, and Wen. We've had a couple talks about this in the past year um, in, the, in the Paris area. And that'll, that'll be a really nice example of, of what we're saying. And this technique will also reveal that this observable is even more simple and special than, than we thought before. Then we'll talk about large n, transitioning to supergravity, making some, some fun comments, and then, and then concluding, okay. So a word on notation. Uh, curly F is the fundamental domain for SL2Z, here shown in purple. I'm gonna take tau to equal X plus IY. So in field theory variables, Y 
is 4 pi over g squared. So large y is small g, the perturbative regime. And I'm going to write functions uh, as functions of tau, but everything depends non-holomorphically on tau. This is what mathematicians seem to do. When we asked a mathematician some question and wrote things as a function of tau comma tau bar, they asked, what are you doing? So for mathematicians, writing things as functions of tau seems normal. That's what I'm going to do, even though <laughs> people working, uh, say, on 2D CFT, that might indicate that something's holomorphically dependent on tau. That's not what's happening here. OK. Uh, good. All right. So let me introduce this, this uh, spectral theory as I know it. The, the main statement is that a square integrable SL2Z invariant function admits a unique decomposition into an eigenbasis, which is also SL2Z invariant. And this eigenbasis has three subspaces. So these are square integrable functions on, on the modular surface F. And there are three subspaces. The first is a constant term, which, as I'll explain with equations momentarily, is just the average of the function over the fundamental domain. The second is a continuous branch, which is spanned by a certain continuum of uh, non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. And the third, more mysterious subspace, is spanned by what are called mass cusp forms. Uh, and there's an infinite number of them. They form a discrete subspace. So if I have some observable O of tau, this first term is the constant. The second term is this continuum. And the third term is this infinite sum over these cusp forms. Okay. And these coefficients are just the inner products of O with the basis elements, where the inner product throughout the talk is defined with respect to the hyperbolic metric like so. So here's a picture of the decomposition. Okay. So by this, I mean I've plotted a few of these basis functions. And what I've really done is I've squared them and taken their, their zero Fourier mode. Okay. What that does is it gets all the Fourier coefficients involved. So there are four curves. The red one is a half, just for rescaling, times the square of one of these Eisenstein series projected onto the zero mode. Okay. So these Eisenstein series are evaluated on what's called the critical line. You take the, the parameter s to equal a half plus i t, and t is just a real number. You integrate from plus to minus infinity. So I've just taken the Eisenstein series with spectral parameter half plus i. I've squared it, and I've looked at the, the zero mode. So this is a function of y, the imaginary part of tau. Okay. That's the red curve. And you notice it's pretty smooth, except for this little feature. Okay. And then the other three is the same quantity, um, but for the three lowest lying cusp forms. Okay. Phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 squared projected onto the zero mode. And those curves look very different. Yes? What you observe that you, you integrate those effects and uh, exactly. the function of, function of points? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Exactly, yep. Um, good. So these curves look different from the red curve and from one another. They look, in a word, chaotic, and indeed they are. The set of extrema um, have sporadic locations. The values of the extrema seem sort of arbitrary. The three curves don't really look like one another. And there are no triple intersections if you look closely, which is what you'd expect for chaotic functions that are defined on a two-dimensional space, the uh, fundamental domain in this case. So these curves look rather different. And the main message is that the, the cusp form piece is this sort of chaotic piece of the decomposition. And the Eisenstein piece is this smooth piece. Okay. So to say, yes, please. This decomposition is true for any weights in modular form, or just modular invariant form? I presented it for modular invariant forms. If you want to add weight, you need to say what the weights are on the left and the right. And I don't know if there's such a universal basis for arbitrary, uncorrelated left and right weights. OK, so in a little bit more detail, um, here's that, that same equation for O. It's slightly different. I've introduced a bracketed overlap. We'll get to that in a second. The first term is easy. Let's dispense with that. So the modular average, what I've called O bar, is just the average of O over the fundamental domain. So the inner product of O with 1 normalized by the inverse volume of the fundamental domain. And remember that even though it's a non-compact space, it has finite volume okay, because of the Poincaré metric, something like uh, pi over 3. Okay. Um, good. So the second piece is the continuous piece. The Eisenstein series is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian with eigenvalue s, 1 minus s in my convention. Here we're taking s to be a half plus it. 
Okay, so this is bounded below by a quarter. If you define what's called the completed Eisenstein series by multiplying it by what is in turn called the completed Riemann zeta function, uh, this E star S obeys a functional equation. It's invariant under S goes to 1 minus S. And the Fourier decomposition is written here. It's rather simple. The zero mode is a sum of two powers. Here I'm talking about powers of Y, which is in tau, just to recall. It's obviously invariant under S goes to 1 minus S. The same is true of the non-zero modes, which uh, functionally are just given by uh, these uh, Bessel or Whitaker functions. Okay. <clears throat> So because the completed Eisenstein series obeys a functional equation, so does this rescaled overlap. So this bracketed overlap is just the inner product divided by one of these completed Riemann zetas to make up for this one, right? And this thing obeys its own functional equation, which is just nice for what happens next. Another important thing about this piece of the decomposition is that the inner product itself can actually be re-expressed just as a Mellon integral of the zero mode of O. This follows from a nice property of the Eisenstein series that it has a Poincaré series representation, and you can use what's called the unfolding trick to write it in this way. But the message is that if you have the zero Fourier mode of O, you can reconstruct this overlap, and therefore this entire part of the decomposition. The cusp forms are interesting and, like I said, more mysterious. They are also eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. This label n just labels which member of the discrete series you're talking about. Uh, and each of them is labeled by a spectral parameter t. Uh, the lowest one is uh, something like 7, um, then 12, then 13, and so on. And they go all the way up to infinity. Their existence was first proven by Selberg, who showed that there's a Viles law growth at large eigenvalue. And there's an infinite number of them, therefore. But they are rather different in nature than the Eisenstein series. Uh, let me just highlight a few things. The first is that there's no zero mode. So here's the Fourier decomposition. This is just some normalization. Here's some Fourier coefficients. Functionally, it is otherwise the same. Uh, but there's no zero mode. And that means that as you go to the cusp at large y, these decay exponentially. That's why they're called cusp forms, basically. They have no, no zero mode. Moreover, the Fourier coefficients and indeed the spectral parameters themselves are not known explicitly in even a single case. So by explicitly, I mean there's no analytic closed form expression in terms of other functions we know. However, they're known to exist, to be infinite in number, to be eigenfunctions of this, this operator, but we don't know them explicitly. It's a very interesting state of affairs. Okay. So what is known is a lot numerically. For example, for, some, for the first 20 or 200, I forget exactly how many of these cusp forms, the first 20 or 200 or so Fourier coefficients are known to 1,000 digits numerically. Okay. So that's pretty good, but it's not exact. Uh, and for many thousands of these, uh, you know, the first, uh, I don't know, 50,000 of these spectral parameters are known. Okay, there's a lot of data. Um, and so there's an interesting situation where at small values of n, there are these extremely precise numerics. And as you go to large values of n, to large spectral parameter, uh, these are believed, and in some cases proven, to exhibit various notions of what's known as arithmetic chaos, which is a whole world within uh, the number theory community. There's some very nice papers by Sarnak talking about this. But the basic idea is that these behave effectively randomly at large eigenvalue. You can model them with superpositions, random superpositions of, of waves on the fundamental domain. And there's a host of conjectures, I've mentioned uh, some of them here by name, which all go under this umbrella. Okay. So are there any questions about this uh, before we move to the physics application? So, uh, I, I just Please. With regard to Einstein, you can, uh, they are known for example, like an Einstein, you can put them Um, good. So the Eisenstein series, yes, but the cusp forms are not. Um, however, there's this useful um, database online of lots of numerical data for these. And you can easily download that, import it into Mathematica, and start playing around. Um, there's much more in the literature that is not in that database, for, but uh, there's a lot that is. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, why cusp? 
Y cusp? Oh, uh, good. Uh, because the large Y region is, is usually referred to as the cusp of the fundamental domain um, because it's a, a point at infinity where, say, at that point is invariant under translations. Um, uh, you know, it's a, so it's a fixed point of a subgroup of SL2Z. So that region is called the cusp. These are called cusp forms because they vanish exponentially at the cusp. They have no zero mode. That's just an historical name, but it refers to the behavior at, at large Y. That's where it came from. Um, a good question. So I don't know. Um, let's see. Then they are interested. It's often actually. Um, yeah. So so remember first I've I've plotted here the uh, the square of the cusp form. Okay. So this is the square. But um, indeed, they're interested in the extrema, and they're interested in, in a lot. Um, but actually, that helps me get to the next slide. So, so here's a picture of a mass cusp form with spectral parameter 500.283548, dot, dot, dot. Uh, this was taken from a nice paper by these first two authors, where they have lots of other nice pictures and, and experiments showing the extent to which you can model these as random weights. So here's a plot in a portion of the upper half plane of one of these guys. Uh, red dots are max and black is min or the other way around, I can't quite remember. But I once knew this and I looked closely and, and you can ask where's the global maximum and where's the global minimum. And before I show you, for the Eisenstein series, with at least with index s greater than one, those locations are universal. They diverge at the cusp for all s, right? So that's the maximum. And the minimum is down here at the corner. But for this function, the minimum is here and the maximum is here. These are random locations, so to speak, from the point of view of a physicist. Okay. And if I change the spectral parameter a little bit, th these points will move around to some other places in the interior of the fundamental domain. Not always, no. And, and in this case, only the minimum is. Uh, and sometimes one of the extrema is here, but sometimes it's not. It's, as far as I can tell, pretty random. Yeah. Uh, the red are supposed to be the minima, local minima, and black are local maxima, or perhaps the other way around. I'm sorry, I forget. Yeah. Yes. So sometimes they change a lot. Yeah. So if I go to a nearby spectral parameter, uh, yeah, the minima and maxima might be somewhere else totally different. No, no, they are never integers, uh, as far as I know. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, point blah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, there, there's not a case that's an integer, I believe, that's known. Yeah. Jeremy, you have a question? Uh, yes, so, just me. So these are real functions. Yes, yeah, that's right. And just a good point. Which is the spectral parameter? Is the same as the Uh close, yeah. So eigenvalue is a quarter plus t squared. Um, so think of so the Eisenstein series, I said you take the index to be a half plus i t. That t is like this t. So the discrete spectrum sits on top of the continuous spectrum. Right? So remember the Eisenstein series has eigenvalue s1 minus s, so that'll be a quarter plus t squared. And for that case, t is a continuum. Here it's discrete. I uh, know they're both they're both above. Yeah, so so yeah, if you follow the eyes around it'll be okay. a quarter plus t squared. S is, S is That's right, yeah. S is a half plus i t. And I've parameterized things so it's s one minus s. There's there's a there's a degeneracy between the eigenvalues of all the discrete cusp forms and the continuum. They're somewhere on top of the continuum, yes. So Ah right. uh, well, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. right. I think nothing deep. Yeah. Jonas, did you have a question? So at the end of the day, the location of these extrema they are specified by the Fourier complexion. I guess that the spectral parameters are not independent. 
random number. But once you know the Boolean coefficients and the corresponding idea of value, then in principle you can calculate this. Yep. Well, because then you know everything. And yeah. yeah. And actually, even it, whether there's a relation between the spectral parameter and the Fourier coefficients, I think it's possible that those aren't necessarily independent data in a sense. Um, there's a paper that I was reading for congruent subgroups of SLTZ where some, some subset of Fourier coefficients was fed in. So suppose you know some of them. Then the author did some experiments where he was able to narrow in on the spectral parameter. So, so it's a little hard to say what's independent because these are all just sort of chaotic data. But they do, at least as a larger and larger parameter, obey these universality uh, conjectures or properties. And so it's possible that they are not as unconstrained as it seems. Unfortunately, this is interesting stuff, but we won't have so much to say about the physics of the cusp forms. I feel that's generally speaking an open question of, that, we, that we didn't answer in our work. Um, we had some things to say about them, but there's a lot. Making the connection between n equals four super mills and all of this uh, is still an open question. Yeah. Okay, so here's sort of the main point. Um, in general, well-defined observables in CFTs are finite for all values of the couplings, possibly away from boundaries and moduli space where they might exhibit divergences. So in this case, we have a one complex dimensional moduli space, and there's one boundary, which is the cusp, but the cusp is just the free theory, where the observables asymptote to their finite free values. So n equals four observables are square integrable, SL2Z invariant, and therefore they admit this spectral decomposition. So that's why we can apply this technique to these observables. And actually, we'll see that the decomposition naturally subtracts the free value. So if you were somehow worried that you had some observable, which as you take the free limit goes to infinity or something, I mean, I would say that's not so well defined over all of the moduli space. But in any case, just subtract out the free value and study the renormalized thing. That's still SO2Z invariant. And that's actually what the spectral decomposition sort of does for you automatically. OK. So there are two implications of this that come sort of for free uh, without doing too much work. And the first is that instantons are redundant in n equals 4 super Yang mills. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's develop a Fourier decomposition <coughs> of O. Sorry, there should be an I here. Uh, if we write it as the sum of the zero mode and the non-zero modes, where remember x is the real part of tau, then what is the Fourier mode number? Well, it's just the instanton number. So it's the total instanton number. If you have some observable, you expand it in powers of q and q bar, where q is e to the 2 pi i tau. You count the number of instantons, the number of anti-instantons, and you subtract the two. That's k. Okay. And the claim is that for k greater than 1, the modes of O are uniquely determined by the k equals 0 and k equals 1 modes. So what is the proof of this strong statement? Well, remember that if you have the 0 mode, you can reconstruct the Eisenstein part of the decomposition. So that's enough to determine that piece completely. And if you have the k equals 1 mode, then you can actually determine the cusp form part in principle, because the Bessel functions, which appear in the Fourier decomposition of these things, obey an orthogonality relation for a purely imaginary parameter, which is what appears in this context. I should emphasize that this assumes that the cuspidal eigenspectrum is non-degenerate. Right? If it were degenerate, then you'd have to disentangle the different overlaps that you're reconstructing by this inversion procedure. This is unproven, but it's widely believed in the math community for SL2Z. Uh, and these papers and many, many others talk about this, assume it in the process of proving various other things. Um, but it's not been proven. It would be nice to prove this. So with that assumption, we see that this holds in n equals 4, which is an interesting statement. So again, just as a picture, if you have no cusp form overlap, just for simplicity, you take the zero mode, you reconstruct this, then you plug it back in, and to get all the non-zero modes, you just insert the non-zero modes of the Eisenstein series, and you're done. Okay. <clears throat> so the second thing that comes for free, so to speak, is the following. If we have a general CFT with a conformal manifold, we can define what I'll call an ensemble average. 
take some observable O, define this bracketed O, uh, this angle bracket O, as the integral of O, which depends on some moduli x, over the conformal manifold M with respect to some measure. Okay? And a natural choice for the measure is the Zamlogikov measure. You can choose other things, but the natural choice is to use that, where you construct it from the Zamlogikov metric, which is just defined to be the matrix of two point functions of exactly marginal operators. Now, in n equals 4 superiang mills, thanks to maximal supersymmetry, it turns out that the Zamlogikov metric is exactly equal to the hyperbolic metric. So what that means is that this ensemble average is just the modular average of O. Okay. So these two things are equivalent. And that's interesting. And in the context of what I said before, it tells us that the spectral decomposition cleanly isolates this ensemble average, a fact which will be useful later. If you're familiar with other superconformal field theories, like for the n equals 2 super QCD, um, there's an SL2Z action there. But the Zamolodzikov metric is not just the Poincaré metric. It's an infinite. It's, a, it's determined by a localization integral, which is complicated. Uh, admits an infinite sum and powers of 1 over y. Uh, but n equals 4 is, as usual, special. OK, so to summarize the point of view, is it yeah. Oh, sorry, can you ask again? That's right, yeah, sorry. So this is a metric. Um, yes, so this is a metric which is defined. Um, I'm going to use the board with apologies to the people online. <laughs> um, oh, good, good, okay. Yes. Sure, sure. Um, So this g mu nu of x, x are moduli, z stands for Zamologikov. This is just the uh, a matrix of two point functions of the exactly marginal operators in the theory, where mu and nu label those operators. So in this case, it's just there's just one complexified gauge coupling, so there's just one. Um, in general, if you had lots of exactly marginal operators and a higher dimensional conformal manifold, you can still define this thing. Now it becomes a proper, you know, larger matrix. What is X mean now? Uh, yeah, sorry. So, so X, I mean, this is in general a function of X. So um, X are in the moduli, say tau, and this thing can depend on tau. So the, in terms of the space-time coordinates, the, a two-point function is fixed by conformal symmetry, but there's a numerator, the norm, if you will, and that can depend on the moduli. But this is the natural metric on this space in the sense that as you move on the conformal manifold, that motion is parameterized by variations with respect to this coupling. And so this is the, the metric you define by two variations of the action upon deforming it by the exactly marginal operator. And you can also define things like a Riemann curvature tensor with four variations and, and study the curvature on this space and so on. But that's the origin of of this thing. Is this something known or um, You mean in general? Uh, the dimension can be large. I don't know if, uh, yeah, I mean, the shorter answer is no, but there are cases where the dimension is 90. Um, for well, for n equals 4, if you want to preserve the n equals 4 super conformal symmetry, it's just this one complex dimensional space parameterized by tau. There are directions that break it down to n equals 1. Then I think it's actually 10, 10 complex dimensional. Yeah. Yes? Exactly, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, good. All right. So the point is that in this language, the essential content of n equals four, after you strip away the SL2Z invariant, lives in these overlaps. Okay. Um, so, in a sense, this is like a conformal block decomposition, where the coefficients of that 
of the essential data, the conformal symmetry is packaged in the blocks. Okay. Um, now, what we want to understand is how to apply this 10 equals 4, what this implies. I won't, certainly won't get to it all. Um, but I think I, I should talk about this integrated correlator because it gives some meat to the story in a specific example. Okay. So I'm going to introduce this object, gn of tau. Take the 20 prime four point function, where the 20 prime is the scalar superconformal primary and the stress tensor supermultiplet. And take the dynamical part, that is the part not fixed by superconformal ward identities, it depends on tau, and also on cross ratios u and v. And you can integrate it over space time, u and v, with some measure, rho, which I'm not writing, but there's a measure, rho, which preserves supersymmetry. So this produces for you a function of tau, which preserves supersymmetry and gets rid of the cross ratio dependence of this four point function. It can also be defined in terms of a uh, free energy when you place the theory on the force sphere and give it a mass deformation. And this thing can be computed by localization methods thus giving you a way to compute this. Okay. So the unintegrated correlator is not, in general, known. But this thing is known, so you can expand it and play with it. And these authors, Dorogoni, Green, and Wen, wrote a beautiful paper where they conjectured an expression that's valid for all n and tau for this object. This expression is a lattice integral representation. There's a two-dimensional lattice sum, a one-dimensional integral, some kernel bn of xi, and then this exponential factor. Um, this bn is a rational function. So for example, for su2, it's just uh, this thing here. For a higher sun, it's just uh, a ratio of polynomials being rational. And the beauty about this expression is that it's simple for all n and for all tau. Okay, it's explicit. And for arbitrary n, uh, there's a remarkable recursion or difference equation that relates the value of this thing in different theories. So, the action of Laplacian on Gn can be rewritten in terms of a linear combination uh, of the same quantity with n shifted up and down by 1. Okay. So if you know the SU2 answer and you take the fact that the n equals 1 theory is trivial, that's enough to bootstrap your way up to higher n uh, as high as you like with this equation. Okay. So this is conjectural, uh, but they gave a lot of evidence that it's true. And there's another representation, which is as a sum of these completed Eisenstein series with real integer indices. This is just a formal representation, which doesn't converge everywhere in the upper half plane. This one does. Uh, and these coefficients, Cs of n, uh, can again be determined by recursion by plugging this into this. That gives you a recursion relation for these. And here are the first two that you use as boundary conditions. Okay. Notice the SU2 one is just this quartic polynomial. So this raised a lot of questions. I thought it was a beautiful paper. Um, I wanted to understand it and to try to prove it. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely clarify a lot about this formula in, in applying these methods. So first, let me give uh, the first sign of that, which is that the integrated correlator and the spectral decomposition, I claim, is exactly given by this. <clears throat> so there's the constant term. There's the Eisenstein part. And the overlap is just given by this pi over sine pi s where these are the same polynomials appearing in the previous slide. And why don't we have a constant Good question. It's something special about this observable. But indeed, that's the main thing to notice. There's no cusp form overlap. And the second thing is that the ensemble average can be easily read off. It's just this first constant term. Okay. But yes, there's no cusp form overlap that in my opinion, is highly non-generic. I think the average observable will have cusp form overlap, but this one just happens not to. It doesn't seem to be straightforwardly uh, a consequence of it preserving supersymmetry. I can explain that later. But um, yeah, this, this thing happens not to, and it's a really nice feature. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, um, I don't see why not at this point. Yeah. Yes. OK. So um, I guess I should go until about 12.05 or so. Is that accurate? All right, good. Um, OK, 
so there's some obvious questions about trying to constrain the overlaps of n equals four observables in this, in this framework by imposing what we know about the theory. So the first is that it must have a sensible perturbative expansion. So one would then ask, how does recoupling perturbation theory work? And how are the overlaps constrained? Okay. So before I proceed, note that perturbation theory is insensitive to cusp forms because they decay exponentially in large y, which was small g. So the zero mode is here. I've just rewritten it. So y to the s appears here. And perturbation theory is large y. So to develop the perturbative expansion, we need to deform this to the left and pick up some series of poles to the left of real s equals a half. Okay. And in doing so, the asymptotics of the series will be encoded in the asymptotics of this overlap at large negative s. And so in particular, whether it converges, diverges, is Borel summable, is not will be encoded as a statement about the functional dependence of this thing on s, at large s. But even just the fact that perturbation theory uh, generates positive powers of gang mil squared and can't generate logarithms tells us that this overlap is highly constrained functionally. And in particular, here's the most general form consisting of that constraint. So there's this pi over sun pi s factor designed to generate poles where you need them for perturbation theory. Okay, so there's y to the s, so for example, y to the minus one is an ordered g squared term. So these are integer poles. Uh, this factor is here for, for convenience. Then there's some function fp, which is basically a regular function whose value on these integers in, encodes the recoupling expansion of the observable in question. Okay. So this thing depends on what O you're looking at. Okay. And then to that, you can add a regular term, essentially regular term, uh, which I've called FNP, which by definition can only contribute to non-perturbative terms with large y. So you can have instanton, anti-instanton contributions, EQ bar terms, EN. So this is a term like that. So these terms won't come from individual poles, but they can come from uh, some regular term in the overlap, which you just insert into the spectral integral and, and uh, and we'll generate such terms uh, of this type. Okay. So with that possibility, you add to the perturbative piece this non-perturbative piece, and this parameterization is the most general parameterization consistent with, with, uh, with perturbation theory. In particular, these functions have to be even under s goes to one minus s, that is reflection symmetric. This is just the SL2D symmetry of, of this object cast as the functional equation. They have to be real, otherwise the perturbative data won't be real. Uh, and apart from possible poles at s equals zero and one, they have to be regular functions. Uh, morally, right, this thing can't have extra poles, otherwise you'd get funny powers of g in the perturbative expansion. Okay. <clears throat> and as far as the asymptotics go, if you look at the large y expansion of some observable O, and you parameterize it in terms of some coefficients c sub n, um, then the relation of c sub n to this data is as follows. You just evaluate fp on the relevant integer, as I said before. But then there's this completed Riemann zeta factor, which is coming from this universal appearance of this thing here. Okay, So that's just something that comes along for the ride. And remember that that actually is proportional to a gamma function. This will be relevant in a moment when we talk about asymptotics and Borel summability. Okay. So now to, again, uh, sort of contextualize this, let's revisit the integrated correlator in this language. As uh, Ricardo observed before, the cusp form overlap is zero. The non-perturbative piece of the overlap is also zero. And the perturbative piece is non-zero, of course. For SU2, it's simply 2s minus 1 squared. And this is the simplest thing you can have in an SL2z invariant perturbation theory in SU2 and equals to our mills. And what do I mean by simplest? I'm trying to say something that I think is, is very um, uncontroversial, which is we have three functions. The two that can vanish do vanish. This one has to be a non-constant entire even function of s minus a half. What's the simplest such function? It's just the degree two monomial. So up to an overall scaling, that's the simplest thing you could write down. And it's remarkable that this observable actually realizes that possibility. In this form, none of this simplicity was, was obvious. This is rather simple and elegant, but uh, 
2s minus 1 squared is even simpler. And in fact, it's the simplest thing you can, you can have uh, consistent with the constraints. Um, good. So now, in general, the perturbation expansion is asymptotic in n equals 4. Um, we can define what's called an SL2Z Borel transform. That's a name we made up. It's a certain special kind of modified Borel transform where instead of just dividing by the gamma function, you divide by this universal Riemann zeta factor appearing in this SL2Z invariant perturbation theory. Um, the nice thing about this is that you can invert this to get back the, an analytic extension of the original function using the fact that this Riemann zeta is just the Mellon transform of a Jacobi theta function. So it's a very nice relation that allows you to use this effectively. And this transform obeys various nice properties. There's a reflection symmetry under C goes to one over C. This thing has to vanish uh, when integrated against this power of C. And the ensemble average is nicely cast in this language. You'll see why I'm mentioning these properties in a second. Let me just note uh, for the moment, this, this second property is especially interesting. Um, it tells you that B has to have a zero somewhere. Right? But why does it have to have a zero? Why does this Borel transform have to vanish for some value of the parameter? I don't know. And in general, the physics of Borel zeros is not so well understood. There's a nice paper by Masasumi Honda in the context of 3D n equals 2 informal theories thinking about this. But this is another context where apparently this is always true. Um, I'd like to understand why. Um, OK, so now back to the instanton story. Then we'll sort of move on to large n. Um, but here's an interesting result I want to, to mention. So what is, all this, what is all this good for? Let's return to this redundancy of instantons point. Okay. So one might ask, for simplicity, let's assume there are no cusp forms in the game. What I'm saying can actually be generalized to that case, but I won't talk about it today. If the zero mode is Borel summable, then are the higher Fourier modes also Borel summable? Naively, it seems like they are, because the latter are determined, to, determined in terms of the former in this way using this algorithm. But it turns out not to be obviously true because the form of the Fourier coefficients for the Eisenstein series differs between the zero and non-zero modes. But it is true. And there's a very striking relation between the convergence radii of the SL2Z Borel transforms in the different Fourier mode sectors. So let's define the zero instanton radius of convergence to be R. So I take my zero mode, I define this transform I look at large order in the sum. This defines the convergence radius R. And let me do the same for the K instanton mode too. So there's some RK. And the relation between the two is simply this. So not only do we see that the K instanton sector is determined by this algorithm, but there's this very simple relation between the asymptotics of these two Borel sums as a function of K, just this quadratic equation. And this is much stronger than what resurgence usually buys you in QFT. Usually resurgence works in a fixed K sector and tells you when you need these kinds of instanton, anti-instanton corrections, given something about the perturbative expansion in that sector. But here we're seeing SL2Z relates to sectors in a very strong way. Uh, this is one of the outcomes of that. It'd be very nice to prove this directly from instanton physics, which is not my specialty, but I think it, this result calls for some further understanding. OK, um, in the interest of time, let me just say for 10 seconds, you can rewrite O in terms of this kind of representation in general when there's no cusp form overlap. And of course, I hope, I hope it's obvious why I'm showing you this. Well, because now we can explain and understand the form of this integrated correlator formula. This thing Bn of C, whose physical origin previously was obscure, is just the Borel transform of the zero mode. I introduced before. So the spectral decomposition I showed you before is equivalent to this thing that's proven. Um, these properties they observed of this kernel Bn, but this is just specific instances of these general properties I showed you before. And we can also check this k instanton radius of convergence result explicitly. If you take the SU2 theory for simplicity, the zero instanton sector gives you r equals one. You can read this off in explicit formulas. And then our formula predicts that rk is one plus k squared. How is that realized here? It's done in sort of a cute way. The explicit formulas lead you to this. You have to maximize p plus q squared over p and q subject to these constraints. And the answer is, is 1 plus k squared, as it should be. 
OK. Any questions? The convergence, uh, when you say that the convergence radius is RK for uh, K instant, on, uh, you mean that you, you, see, you control the singularity that stop the uh, analyticity? Yeah, so it, yeah. right, that's right. So the, here I'm um, imagining we have some observable whose perturbative expansion is asymptotic. I can I construct this SO2V Borel transform. And the location of the singularity on the positive real axis is at that at that location given by this formula. Okay, uh, and do you understand if there is a? Uh, I mean, uh, what is the classical? Uh, I don't understand that. Yeah, uh, so configuration. That that's right. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's supposed to be a universal answer to that question or just somehow the location is universal. Or, in any case, I, I don't have an insight into that, but okay. it would be nice to know. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, I actually think the formula also applies to the num, with some sign flip, also applies to the number ensemble case, because in that case, all the changes, you know, the perturbative expansion <laughs> is the same. Um, all the changes is wh where the singularity is. Um, anyway, that, that's just a side comment, but. Um, Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes, so we're gonna talk about the holographic side. Um, good, this was meant to be sort of quick anyway. Um, let me take a moment to, to think. We're actually gonna skip some of this stuff um, and kind of go to this. All right, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, Here's the formula that was just being analyzed in the previous slides. Let me just say in words some of what is important about it um, and what it is. So we're looking in the TUF limit, large n, small g, g squared n fixed, that defines lambda. And in the TUF limit, the non-zero modes are non-perturbatively suppressed in n because they go like e to the minus y, and y is n over lambda, n is large, lambda is fixed. So the zero mode admits a genus expansion. And in the spectral decomposition, suppressing various coefficients and, and turning off uh, the non-perturbative piece of the overlap just to demonstrate how things look schematically, this is the formula you get for the zero mode in, in the TUF limit. Okay, there's a constant from the ensemble average. There's the genus sum. And there are two terms in the spectral integral, one for each of the terms in the zero mode of the Eisenstein series, rewritten in terms of n and lambda, processed appropriately. And there's some overlap function fp at genus g. This is the perturbative piece of that overlap I mentioned before. What I want you to see here is that there are these, first of all, there are these terms at large n at fixed genus. The SL2z expansion reorganizes the genus expansion for you in, in a kind of interesting way. But we're expanding at large n, so we have to deform this part of the contour to the right, and the power of n is 1 minus 2s, and since we're going to the right, of real s equals a half, this will give us terms suppressed in one over n. Okay. Now the first term is lambda to the minus s, so at large lambda you also deform to the right. This also gives you terms suppressed at large lambda. So to leading order, say a genus zero, at large lambda and large n, the only thing that survives is this. So to say this a little differently, in the most general analysis, generalizing that to include f and p and including coefficients in the right way, we can write the most general strong coupling expansion that just falls out from the spectral decomposition. And for simplicity, let's take the observable O to start at genus zero in order n squared. It looks like this. There's an n squared in front. There are these subleading terms at large lambda that we're accustomed to. And the leading term is given by the leading term of the ensemble average of O. That is to say the n squared piece of the average, which was that constant term in the previous formula. And this is an uncanny formula. It looks a lot like what we usually work with at large lambda, except the infinite lambda piece is the average. So we immediately get to identify the large lambda limit of O with the large n ensemble average of O. 
invoking holography, we know that the strongly coupled planar theory is the supergravity regime in the bulk. So we have this equivalence at large n. So here's a picture. Again, on the right, we're meant to imagine working at finite n, performing the ensemble average of some observable O, and then taking the large n limit. And on the left, we're imagining sitting at the large n, large lambda point, which I've schematically depicted as sitting at the cusp here. Okay. So the point is that for any observable O, which survives the supergravity limit, these two quantities are equivalent. Yes? Uh, good, sorry. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, no, we'll do it in the board. So, we take a double scaling limit of g going to zero and going to infinity and lambda fixed. At large lambda, this is the regime of strong Tuft coupling. The theory is conjectured to be dual to type 2b supergravity in this ADS5 times S5 background. And so that's the regime that I'm commenting on here. And I'm noticing that the strongly coupled theory can be rephrased as the large n ensemble average theory, at least at the level of SL2z invariant observables O. Okay. okay. So to understand sort of what's going on in an intuitive way, maybe this is a useful way to think about it. If you imagine working at fixed tau, so instead of the Tuft limit and taking large n, the leading term is supergravity, and all the tau dependence is tucked away in the subleading terms. So if the supergravity term has order n squared scaling, the next terms start at root n and on and on, and they come multiplied by SL2z invariant functions of tau, say, non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, if you're familiar with the art of the fourth correction in type 2b supergravity. Um, so this suggests that to leading order in one over n, the average gives supergravity, because to leading order, the tau dependence drops out, so an average just gives you back one once you normalize it by the volume. Is that what's happening? And I think morally that is what's happening, but this is not a proof that that is correct. And the reason is that the one over n expansion and the average don't commute. So you need to average at finite n and then take large n. And that's manifest here by way of the fact that these functions f are not square integrable. So they grow at the cusp like powers of y. So you can't average them. That gives you infinity, and the calculation is uncontrolled. Moreover, if you try to regularize that, you get wrong answers. So here's schematically the form of the expansion. I've just picked some representative observable O. Um, so the first subleading term is order root n, for example, but recall that, for example, for the integrated correlator, the subleading term is order n. So you don't get the right large n counting. Um, so there's no way to regularize this that gives you good answers. Um, but the calculation we did confirms this intuition in a rigorous way. Uh, why does this break down? Uh, it breaks down because the the powers of n appearing beyond leading order are not the right ones. They're not consistent with yeah, what you actually find. Uh, yes. I mean, well, I think, that, I mean, the, the reason, we know the reason it doesn't work formally, which is that you can't, you can't average these functions. They, that gives you infinity. Then the question is, if you have an infinite series of things which are, you know, zero times infinity, what do you get? And the answer is that you do indeed get corrections that are subleading to the leading thing which you would have expected, and those corrections are different powers of n. So if you wanted to regularize this by, say, replacing these by some regularized integrals, that's not going to give you the right answer term by term because you're missing powers of n that are supposed to be there or that can be there. So for example, a, a common regularization of these types of integrals in the string theory context comes from some work by Zagier. In that regularization, Eisenstein series um, would, would be replaced by zero. 
And this thing, which I haven't explained, it's a kind of inhomogeneous generalization of an Eisenstein series, would be replaced by some constant. But uh, so this would mean like an order n squared piece plus an order one over n piece. Uh, that's not what you find. Um, yeah. OK. So just some comments. The traditional holographic correspondence still holds. We're not saying that n equals 4 should be replaced by its ensemble average when we think about holography. Just that there is an emergent average at strong coupling and large n. So you can think of the strongly coupled theory equivalently, at least for the subset of observables that supergravity uh, contains, as, as averaged. And sort of conversely, the averaging, like it does in these lower dimensional examples in ADS2, um, generates a simple bulk dual, which in this case is the extremal theory, aka the theory with the largest possible gap consistent with symmetries of the problem. <clears throat> it also suggests to me an interesting, possibly plausible new strategy for deriving ADS5 times S5 supergravity from CFT. Instead of looking at large lambda limits of planar n equals 4, try to develop a theory of averages such that you can compute the average of something for finite n and then take its large n limit. This equivalence tells you that those will give you the same answer. You know, this is traditionally how we think about it, but if you could somehow develop a way to compute averages without computing the value you know, exactly as a function of lambda, then this would give you another way to extract the supergravity behavior. Yes. Well, the average gets rid of the coupling. Oh, so. sure. But you're right. It, I mean, the challenge here is that it's a finite n. So, so you're replacing planar for all lambda with non-planar for all n, which is easier. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. But um, one reason for possible optimism is that in two dimensions, there's been some recent work that derived the average spectral gap in Narain CFTs, which are theories of free bosons on, on tori. And that average spectral gap is not something that can be explicitly confirmed by scanning the space of such theories, but the derivation of the average is robust and correct. So it's possible that some version of this may be uh, um, discoverable in n equals 4. But maybe not. I mean, you mean uh, average with the uh, local operators or also Wilson loops? So here, pretty much everything I'm saying has been referring to local observables. The reason is just that things like Wilson loops are not SL2Z invariant, but they are invariant under congruent subgroups of SL2Z. Um, for example, for the SUN n equals 4 theory, um, S duality takes SUN to SUN mod ZN, but there's some gamma 0 of n subgroup of SL2Z, which preserves, which is, which is truly a self duality, even for extended objects. There should be some spectral decomposition for for that that applies in this context. I mean, that spectral decomposition is partly understood, just like the SL2Z one. It's more intricate, though. There are more cusps for these congruent subgroups and so on. But as for what happens in that context at large n, then uh, I haven't studied it, so I'm not quite sure. Yeah. OK, um, good. So uh, time, is, time is up, so let me just say a few more words and then take questions. The obvious question is how this generalizes to ADS-CFT at large. We had some comments in the paper about different scenarios that could, could be um, without committing to any one. We'd like to collect some more data. But the basic idea is that some automorphic average over S-duality groups, or more likely, in my opinion, some kind of ensemble average over conformal manifolds n in cases where there's a supergravity regime at large n, localizes onto the supergravity. Um, you can think about this in the ADS3 times S3 times C4 context for, um, for a concrete example. In this case, there are 20 moduli. There is an S duality group. And there's one coupling G, which in a double scaling limit takes you out to a supergravity regime. So, so here's the free point, here's supergravity, and there's all the other moduli in the orthogonal non gravity direction, so to speak. So, what average could lead to a supergravity theory? Well, there are two basic possibilities that you can imagine or at least what I could imagine. The first is that you average over all of M, like we did in N equals 4. And the second is that you just average over this direction, G, thus leaving the other moduli on average. How you do these averages, what measure you use, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure it may matter in the end. 
Um, the only other comment I want to make is that this first scenario is a little funny. It averages over everything. So in other words, the bulk is also average. But it could nevertheless land you on a simple theory of supergravity, which would be nice. Um, one other thing we did sort of encouraged by what we found was to study the statistics of this SL2Z ensemble, which was the name we gave to the space of n equals four theories parameterized by tau. Um, I think this is a nice thing to do in general, not just in the context of holography, but the holographic questions about wormholes that people have been studying lately uh, in this correspondence that, that we discovered encouraged us to do it. Um, in the interest of time, I will, I will not talk about this, but um, you can compute the variance of some observable O over the space. There's a nice formula for it in spectral language. It's this, basically just second moment of these overlaps in spectral space. And dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, here I anticipated that I would not want to <laughs> go too much over time and talk about wormholes and so on, but I'd be happy to in another context. So here is the summary of the talk. Um, and there are some future directions that I think are really interesting. Some of them are more bootstrappy, say applying this to other observables. Some are more holographic. And some are more trying to bridge this gap between the math and the physics of this decomposition. So hopefully um, you're interested and happy to discuss. And thanks for listening. Could you imagine some similar statements for different gauge group, like maybe SON or symplectic, where probably it would map to another, to a Langlands dual and uh, S duality or something like that? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, um, so if we stick to the, so for the non-simply laced case, so if we take the SO there, if you insist on studying the self-duality group, so instead of, so, so I'd like to, to do that because I don't want to have to talk about mapping between two theories. I want to talk about an invariance in a single theory. Then um, SL2Z is replaced by one of the congruent subgroups of SL2Z. So, these, so I think it's either gamma naught of two or gamma naught of three, which are these subgroups of SL2Z where one of the entries is divisible by either two or three. And that's what's relevant for that case. So then the question would be, is the spectral decomposition known for those congruent subgroups? Um, modulo not knowing everything about the cusp forms, yes, it is. And I think it's worth studying that a bit. Yeah. There are also, I guess I mentioned here, these Hecke triangle groups. So those are, those are also relevant for this non-simply laced case. These are other quotients of the upper half plane that have fundamental domains that look a bit like that of SL2Z, except it just, it's a wider, <laughs> the circle is different. Um, but yeah, so th those are the, the two generalizations where something is known and it's directly relevant to looking at n equals four with non-simply laced gauge group. Um, yeah, I, I'm starting to look at that in some detail. Well, which is most recent paper where he talks about sub, uh, substitutional observables you don't need to average and then black hole observables you need to yeah. average over. Uh, do you see some similar effects in your uh, calculation? Uh, no, so 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 I have some backup slides about that. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna just to make sure I get my my thoughts parsed correctly. Uh, do I have them? Yeah. Um, good. Okay. So so first, let me just say something a little differently than you said it. They don't want to actually do an average. They're asking in a theory where. Say all the moduli are fixed, or if there are moduli, they are identified between the two sides as usual. Which observables appear ensemble averaged, and which ones don't? Okay, so that's the question they're asking, and then why? And so they argue basically what you said, that those involving black hole states appear averaged, and those that don't involve black hole states don't appear averaged. In our story, there's no, um, in this equivalence between the average and supergravity, there's no sensitivity to that, as far as I can tell, but it's an open question in a couple ways. Um, but first, I would say that I think the papers talk nicely to each other in, in a couple ways. First, both papers are, are 
making the point that large n drives a strongly coupled system to appear average. And the second point is that, so in that paper, they, they and in talks, Witten seems to make this point that the black hole Hilbert space is not well defined at large n. So taking that at face value, we should only talk, when we say O supergravity, we should only think of that as being a, in their language, set of threshold observable, something that doesn't involve a black hole state because we're working a leading order in large n and large lambda, but a leading order in large n with no good definition of, say, a black hole microstate. So if we restrict our discussion to, uh, to the non-black hole Hilbert space, then um, uh, our paper gives a kind of explanation for why they appear unaveraged. It's because the average and the unaverage coincide. So, in other words, from their point of view, everything appears average, but just for the subthreshold observables, the average is the same thing as just looking at the supergravity value itself. But, um, well, we didn't talk about wormholes at all in this talk, but I think our, our paper brings up some kind of connections to the wormhole story, but certainly doesn't answer what these formulas have to do with wormholes in ADS 5 and ADS 5. Um, to, to answer your question, you need to answer those questions. Uh, you, you flashed the, the image of the octagon. Uh, oh. I, uh, um, um, did you? Did uh, I? Uh, oh, this one in the middle. There was no octagon. Oh. Um, no? Or, or, this, or this one? Yes. Yeah, or yeah good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so did you, did you want to tell something about uh, some, some insights uh, from the average of the about uh, this uh, sure so I have I have nothing to say about the octagon per se but I was using this this figure from that that paper of Barguer, Coronado and Vieira to, to as a picture of a string world sheet instant on an ADS5 and this five and one of the things that I would have said with more time was that let me just I won't launch into some long discussion but just to show the result while we're talking about it this formula implies that if you have non-perturbative effects at large lambda, then you also have non-perturbative effects in N. So why is that? Non-perturbative effects in large lambda come from the asymptotics of this when you develop the large lambda expansion. But the same asymptotics are going to give you non-perturbative terms from here. And what is lambda here is N squared over lambda here, which is what I call this S-dual TIFF coupling. So if you have effects that are non-perturbative in this scale, then you also have effects in this scale. And there's a natural bulk explanation, right? This is just the S-dual of this. These are F-string instantons, these are D-string instantons. And this picture is just meant to be a picture of that. Um, so nothing about the octagon per se, but um, yeah, I, I haven't seen so much or really any discussion of D-string instantons in ADS5 and ADS5, but I think the point is that SL2Z gives you them for free. If you have the one, then, then you have the other. Um, which is, I think, a nice, nice. nice thing. Yeah. Sorry, can I ask again? I just didn't hear. Yeah, that, that was the part that you skipped in the middle of the talk. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks. I wanted to explain this formula a little bit better, but basically, when you develop the TUF limit, you take the zero mode, you, you trade Y for N and lambda, and then you need to know how the overlap, how, what the large n expansion of the overlap is. So there's a simple argument for that. It leads to this where I'm suppressing, suppressing some details. And this has various features, one of which is the one I just said. But the main point is that you, you have these two terms. This one looks sort of normal, like it's going to give you the lambda dependence of whatever you're talking about. And this one looks a bit funny, but it's an SL2Z partner in the sense that it comes from this Eisenstein zero mode. And it has various implications, um, one of which is what I said before. Another of which is that, you know, the genus expansion means observables have one over n expansion in powers of one over n squared. And so here, that means that without any other terms here, in particular with this non-perturbative piece turned off, the poles have to be at half integer values of s, otherwise they violate that condition. 
And so that means that there's a nice diagnostic for when you have this non-perturbative piece. If you have an integer power of one over lambda, which you know, often, usually, you do at large lambda, um, then the non-perturbative piece is non-zero, else you would not have a consistent turf expansion. Um, so anyway, it, there are these three implications of this structure, um, and that's where that picture came from. Yeah. Other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Eric okay. again. Ah, yes. <laughs>